I'm Matt McCright. Uh, I'm a concert pianist and a professor at Carleton College in Minnesota. Uh, I have been asked to do this project for Composer's Voice, so I'm very thrilled to do that. I will be playing eight pieces by eight composers that uh, some of whom I've worked with before, some of this is a brand new experience for me to work with them and their music. And so it's been a great journey for me to kind of not only get to know another person, it's getting to know another person intimately. I have played in New York several times, but never at the big venue, the one that we've all dreamed about since we were kids uh, and hoping that a career in music could happen for us. Classical music, of course, is steeped in a European tradition and they have, of course, many impressive venues there, but really Carnegie Hall stands out as America's venue. You realize that when you are finally stepping onto that stage, that all of that work was worth it, that you finally have been able to step into a history of a venue that is much larger than you, and you get to have a small part of that, and you get to take that away with you after that experience, and I think that's probably the most thrilling part personally as a performer. Now, of course, doing this venue it is great for me, but I find it even better that I get to take eight new fr and old friends with me who get to enjoy that also. It's not me playing, you know, Debussy. He's had lots of performances at Carnegie Hall, but the eight composers that I'm gonna be playing have not. And what a great thing that I get to do is collaborate with these composers and, and join them on stage to have an experience that I think is, is going to be quite magnificent. And we are all looking forward to uh, making new friends today, seeing old and getting to know some people better. Welcome everyone to our celebration for the release of pianist Matthew McCright's double album, Endurance. McCright has been called an intrepid explorer of new music and has performed extensively throughout the United States, Europe, Asia, and the South Pacific as a piano soloist and a chamber musician. His imaginative programming places the greatest piano repertoire alongside the music of today's most innovative composers. His new album, Endurance, commemorates his performances of works by Kirsten Broberg, Kyung Mi Choi, Christopher Coleman, Sean Fryer, Mike McFerrin, Ingrid Stolzel, Robert Voisey, and me. Dorothy Heinemann. Matthew performed our music on the Composer's Voice concert program at Weill Recital Hall at Carnegie Hall on Friday, November 22nd, 2019. Today we have a tasting menu format. Matthew will be performing excerpts and we'll have each composer tell us a little bit about their works. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Matthew performing Wanting Night Music, a movement from my piano solo, Forward Looking Back.
Wow. <laughs> Great piece, Dorothy. Wonderful. So, um, who am I? I am Robert Voise. I am the CEO of Vox Novus and the director of Composer's Voice Concert Series. And Composer's Voice Concert Series is a uh, place that I created to promote and present uh, contemporary composers uh, to have their works heard by audiences around the world. Um, back in, um, actually, this is back in 2018, um, I was approached uh, by some people to, to do a special composer's voice that would be featuring uh, Matthew McCrite uh, for his premiere performance at Weill Hall at Carnegie Hall. Um, so we started putting it together and we found um, uh, uh, seven great composers and me to get a Carnegie Hall premiere and uh, just to get their works heard. Um, there were several premieres and a lot of encores and so forth. And as we were doing all this, that's, um, I was like, well, we're doing all this work. We should put together a uh, CD. Um, and so this, this we have our Carnegie Hall performance was in uh, November of 2019. So, and then, you know, we had all the recordings and so forth that we've been putting together. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been a journey. And so I went to Matt and it was just like, um, you know, Matt White, you know, we're putting all this together. Do you have a name for the album? Um, and he's like, what do you think about endurance? And, uh, you know, it's, uh, I, I didn't realize how prophetic that title would be, but it, it, uh, it really was. And, uh, maybe, maybe if you can bring on Matt, where are you, Matt? Are you still at the piano? Okay, there you go. Hi, Matt. Hello there. So why don't you, why don't you tell, uh, us a little why you picked, uh, endurance as the title? Cause this was. This title's uh, actually, a, we picked this way in the, in the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. If I remember correctly. Right. Endurance was a program idea that I had had um, several years ago. And it kind of was a chance to, when I was much younger to be able to focus on some of the more virtuosic pieces that I had played um, as a program if I was ever asked to uh, kind of showcase that kind of playing. And when I got a look at the scores that I was sent for this particular performance, it, in the back of my head, it kind of set up a lot of red flags just because the, um, not only was the music virtuosic, but it was also a lot of the themes of the pieces required uh, similar synonyms to endurance. Uh, cool, yeah, and well, you know what? I think that's probably maybe a great segue into my piece. Um, uh, mm. It's called The uh, Persistence of Melancholy. Um, Again, so. apropos to our <laughs> world we live in right now. <laughs> Hello there, Sean. Hello. How are you? So uh, I, you have kind of the, the privileged position of having a piece that we played at, at, at Carnegie Hall that I've played the longest uh, of anything. And so um, we uh, kind of met online, and I was kind of curious about a piece that you had written many years ago called Elastic Loops. And I liked the recording, which I believe was you playing, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to see if I could 
actually accomplish the same kind of level of uh, uh, virtuosic display that uh, your recording did. And when I reached out, then you had said, well, why don't we revise this? <laughs> And then I had no idea what I was getting involved with. So maybe you can kind of answer what kind of prompted you to, to think about a, an older piece and expanding it uh, almost uh, twice as long now. Sure. Yeah. Well, first, poor you, right? Because you were thinking, <laughs> oh, this is, a, this is an eight minute piece. It sounds pretty hard. It is an endurance test right. in the original version. Right. And then I yeah, went and made it twice as long. Um, yeah, it was, it was really serendipitous timing when you got in touch with me because um, I had been, this was one of those pieces and I have a couple where I just never feel quite done with them. Even though there's, you know, there's a double bar line, it sounds like a complete piece. I'm always thinking about, oh, I could have extended this or gone in a different direction. And so it had been on my list for a long time to revise this. And then when you got in touch, that was the perfect uh, impetus. It's like, all right, it's happening now. <laughs> this is as good as an opportunity <laughs> as any. Um, so, yeah, that was that was really, um, yeah, the impetus for that. And that was, what was funny about that is usually when you revise a piece, you're revising a piece that's, I don't know, a year or two old. You have some, you know, tweaks in orchestration or little imperfections you want to fix. But this was a piece that I wrote in 2007, really one of my earliest pieces that's I still allow to exist in the world. Um, <laughs> and so coming back to revise it, you know, 12 years later, there's a lot that has uh, changed, you know, in my thinking, my experience, my taste. And so that was, it was kind of fun to, on the one hand, feel like I really recognize myself in the piece. And on the other hand, feel like I was almost changing someone else's music. Um, mm. And then it was really fun to to give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, I think, um, uh, we may hear a small excerpt of this, but I think the kind of uh, elastic loop title, maybe you can kind of talk about what the kind of uh, musical implications of that were rather than just the basic two words mean in everyday language. What did it mean for you musically? Um, I guess in a really general sense, um, I like the idea of, you know, think, I mean, I think in most music that people listen to and like, there's a lot of repetition. Um, and for me, I wanted to find a way in this piece to, on the one hand, have have the music be comprised of a lot of repetition, but have n almost no literal repetition so that ideas are always changing, contracting, expanding in a variety of ways, which I think maybe makes it more fun to listen to and a lot harder to play since you can't just, <laughs> yeah, there aren't actually that many literal loops in the piece. Right. This is a, a bit of a play on words for what a musician would expect to, you know, a contemporary musician thinking, okay, I kind of have an idea of what that might mean. And then when I actually got the score and then I realized, well, there's, there's very little of them. <laughs> and uh, you're, my wits had to be about me. Uh, almost the entire 16 minutes of the piece, there was very little downtime. Um, were you, I mean, this is kind of a strange question to maybe ask, but uh, how were you thinking about uh, writing virtuosic music for pianists who may or may not want to take on a project of, of the amount of time that would take to kind of make that piece really workable in a, in a public setting? I guess I'd have to say this is a self-selecting piece and that um, I don't think I would want someone who didn't like the idea of the challenge, like, oh boy, mm. I'm going to have to really put some time into this and really not just be, you can't read through the piece. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, it's too fast. It's too easy to trip up. Um, and so I think, yeah, it's, uh, there's some pieces you write, you know, where a lot of people could work it up pretty quickly. And it's certainly nice to have those pieces in your catalog. And then this is one where it's, it's okay if only a special person every now and again comes along who really wants to do that. Mm. And I think, I hope, it is, it's rewarding when it actually starts to click and feel comfortable. And I think it does, you know, it, it, it can show the performer in a good light, but up until you get to that point, it's probably not something you want to share in public. Right, exactly. Well, I think we're now going to hear an excerpt for us. I'm going to turn that back over to our uh, wonderful engineers to kind of cue that up so we can kind of hear a, an excerpt of this.
Thanks for attending the album release of Endurance. I just wanted to take a moment to say thanks to everyone involved in the production of this album. In particular, I'd like to thank all of the great composers. I found your music really inspiring, and I'm, I'm just so grateful to you for being part of this project. Finally, I'd really like to thank Matthew McCright uh, for his inspired performances and uh, his dedication to championing new music. I want to just play a short excerpt from my work, uh, Apprehension of the Eternal Will. I hope you enjoy it, and again, thanks for attending. Bye-bye. Hello, Kirsten. Hi, Matt. So um, I think uh, you also have a special honor in this kind of whole setup here is that we've known each other the longest, I think, of any composer relationship I had in this project. So um, I know your music quite intimately. It was actually your piece, Constellations, was on my very first album. 
a lot of years ago. <laughs> and so I was uh, super excited to actually uh, continue okay. to kind of get acquainted with your rec more recent piano music. So I was wondering if you could talk to the audience that's watching a little bit about how these kind of pieces fit into your larger kind of framework of, of composition. Sure. Thanks so much for having me. It's good to see you, Matt. Um, so I write a lot of cycles of extractable works. So hour long pieces that have segments that can be extracted as individual works. And Rain Gardens that you're going to hear Matt play an excerpt from is from my Natura cycle. And interestingly, Constellations that he has on his first CD is also part of that cycle, but there's an orchestration of it for full orchestra. So the cycle ranges from solo, piano, this is the smallest um, instrumentation in the cycle, to full orchestra um, of the 11 work cycle. So that's how it fits in with uh, that piece and with the rest of my, my works. Excellent. So uh, I think maybe to give us a little hint of what the kind of Natura like kind of theme is. I mean, obviously, what are some of the other pieces that might give uh, some illumination to those uh, ideas? Sure. So the, the cycle is called Natura and everything is related to nature in that cycle. So this one's called Rain Gardens and it was inspired by WC's Gardens in the Rain to a small extent. Just that idea of a cascading gesture on the piano that has a short um, articulated notes repeated after, after the end of the cascade, and then the piece evolves through these spectral um, harmonies that are based on overtone structures throughout the piece, and then it ends with these giant cascades that mm -hmm. cascade down the piano like waterfalls. Constellations is about um, constellations in outer space, and that piece um, goes into my orchestral piece, Celestial Dawning, that's about like the beginnings of the solar system. So you'll find rain in the cycle, you'll find tendrils, there's a clarinet piece called Tendrils, um, Moonlight Refracted that has a bit of inspiration from the Moonlight Sonata and some other pieces that are all inspired by nature. One of which is As of Snow that I wrote um, at a cafe in Minneapolis and then it was premiered in Chicago and almost didn't make it to the premiere because of a snowstorm. So. <laughs> Oh, well, nature at its finest, right? So <laughs> right. I think we're going to hear now an excerpt of this piece. So um, we'll kind of hand that back to the engineers so we can listen to some of this. Rain Gardens.
composers are looking to every possible source for inspiration. There's no one kind of common practice way anymore. And so I think that gave me this ability to look at the world from the practical standpoint of how do I make a career doing this? And it really opened up because I found out that there were very few pianists like me doing that, that would do what I do, meaning almost exclusively new music. With composers, I feel like I'm getting right to the heart of them. And then, of course, dealing with them, asking questions back and forth, I get to know a little bit more about them. And so this has been a, a great experience so far, um, kind of re being created to old friends again, of course, but also meeting several new friends. You know, we can't really make a phone call to Brahms and ask, what did you mean by this and why would you write it this way? But when I was working with living composers, it was very easy to kind of get a sense of why is it this way? And sometimes there's a little bit of a fine line where composers have to be kind of told, especially if they're not pianists, that you can't always get everything because of the risk it can be to the person. Um, and so that kind of back and forth, you, again, you can't get that with Mendelssohn. It is what it is, and if you can't play it, you don't play it. But with a living composer, you can maybe you can adapt it. Maybe you can kind of ask, can I leave out that particular note? Because it's making my hand do a really strange stretch that's hurting me when I practice. And then, by and large, almost every composer I've worked with has always said, yeah, I'd rather have you play the piece than you know, live to get every single note down. And I'm back, Dorothy Heinemann, with Kyungmi Choi. And Kyungmi, um, it's a pleasure to introduce you. Kyungmi is an old friend. We've known each other a very, very long time. <laughs> and um, I, I've enjoyed um, listening to your music all over these, uh, over all of these years. And Kyungmi is not just a composer. She is also a visual artist, an organist, which I didn't know until just now, <laughs> um, a, a painter and a poet, and a poet. So you kind of do everything, yeah? <laughs> Not everything, some. <laughs> some. Well, any, anyway, um, Kyungmi, so you employ extended techniques and speaking and all kinds of different elements in your music, um, which makes sense, right? If you're a poet and uh, um, a musician yourself. And it seems to me, and I've spoken with Matt about this, that usually a pianist, you know, is trained to put all of their emotional expressivity in their hands and out through the music. You know, that's kind of the cultural uh, way that we're used to it. It's the performance practice. And so, but when you ask a pianist to say, speak or do something dramatic or, um, have have some kind of extended techniques with the piano um how how does that affect how a pianist would approach the expression of emotion in the piece you know when it's so completely sort of outside of what they would normally do well oh, thank you it's very uh, interesting question and i think that um in a way that everything either it either it's you know extended technique or not I always uh, consider them as a sound source. So I found the extended technique uh, is something that probably not necessarily practice that much, but it's an extension of what I'm trying to do, so to speak. So that's uh, where I think uh, it's not a just isolated event. It's more connected uh, with the previous context or what will come next. So it is in a way the extension of the uh, expression. So I do not think uh, in a separate entity and which some composers consider that way, which I also respect. Mm -hmm. But for me, I found that is an uh, expression in the phrasing or sentiment or sensation that I want to uh, enhance a little bit through this. That's how I uh, see it. And I hope that's how listeners to also perceive that way. Mm -hmm. So Matthew is uh, one of these new music specialists, right? But that still means he doesn't have a, a blueprint 
for how to interpret these works that are, are completely new. When you worked with him, did you have to coach him at all about how to interpret the extended things or was he sort of naturally just able to do those things? Oh, he was just completely his own. <laughs> and all I did come in and congratulate him. And <laughs> we didn't really have to talk that much. I was really, really impressed. Yeah, congratulations again, Matthew and you, Kyungmi, and I think we're going to hear Matthew actually perform some of your piece live at this point, so we'll look forward to that right now. Coleman, composer of The Outrage Machine. I'm coming to you from Hong Kong, where I've lived and taught composition for the past 32 years or so. I wrote The Outrage Machine for Matthew McWright, specifically for this concert and recording. Um, our project was collaborative, but I have something of a bad history about being a collaborator. Um, I tend to write things that uh, I really sort of get stuck on and I want them to be exactly the way that I wrote them. I was writing a piece for Harp uh, for a very dear friend of mine um, and it was a piece about the death of my mother and this was the piece that finally taught me how to be a good collaborator because the harp is a very difficult instrument to write for and um, Oh, we went round and round and round and round on that. And um, finally, I kind of threw up my hands and I said, well, just play whatever you can. And she did. And at that point, I realized that it was actually better than what I'd written because I tend to write these very, very thick and dense textures. And especially for the harp, it didn't work at all. Well, I'm not a pianist either. Um, and when I was asked to write for Matthew, and he's such a fine pianist. I was a little bit anxious about it because I feel like I don't know the instrument nearly well enough to do it justice for such a virtuoso. Um, but nonetheless, I was very interested in doing the piece, and it's about outrage. It had to be about an angry piece, a dense piece. It's fast, it's loud. Uh, there's a lot of banging, it's very dark and uh, in the low register and there's lots of thick, thick textures. And so I, I wrote the thing, um, well really the first collaborative thing that, that happened was I, I was, had about a year to write it and I kept putting it off and putting it off and then I said, oh, can I send it in a month late? Can I send it in two months late? <laughs> and, 
everyone was very nice and they let me do that. Um, but so when I finally wrote it, I sent it off and um, Matthew had some ideas. I knew that the textures, especially at the speed that I wanted, might be problematic because I was able to play it, but very, very slowly. Um, but it was supposed to go extremely fast. Um, and so Matthew came through with some suggestions uh, that I thin out the textures in a lot of spots and I took some of them and others I took to hand, uh, took to mind and, and, um, and thought of other ways to express those textures and a few I, I simply said well I really do need this texture here and, um, and so it was a really very good uh, process together. I think Matthew liked the piece from the beginning. Um, uh, and it's a very dramatic piece. Um, and so I hope you enjoy this, uh, this excerpt from The Outrage Machine. Hello, I'm Ingrid Stölzel, and I'm the composer of Unus Mundus. The piece was commissioned for the centennial celebration of Korean composer and longtime German resident, Is Sang Yun. I've long been fascinated by Yun's compositions, and whenever I'm asked to write a, a piece of music in memory of another person, I want to find a way to bring them into my compositions. Is Sang Yun believed in the power of music, and he was strongly influenced by Taoist philosophy, in which the dark and the light are intertwined with each other. I believe that music, in its deepest expression, has the power to fuse opposites to create oneness that cannot be fragmented. Because as Carl Jung says, and I quote, everything divided and different belongs to one and the same world. This concept, which Jung called Unus Mundus from Latin, one world, seemed like a fitting title for a composition honoring Isan Jung. Thank you so much.
What a beautiful piece. That was just, that was just absolutely wonderful. Um, thank you, Ingrid. That was great. And thank you, Matt. Um, I, in fact, for this project, I'd like to thank um, all the composers that have been on this project. Uh, Ingrid, Mike, Kirsten, Sean, Kyungmi, Dorothy, and Christopher. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's been an honor and a privilege to be a part of, you know, this cast of composers uh, to, and uh, yeah, be share the stage on Carnegie, be part of this album. Uh, so yeah, we uh, produced a, a double CD. It seems to be a Vox Novus tradition of doing uh, double albums. Um, it's been a long time since a Vox Novus has uh, pressed an album. Just, uh, oh, did I thank Matthew McRae? Yeah, it's not just Matthew McRae. It's awesome. He's the best. I can't... Uh, Matt, thank you for your fantastic performance of my piece. It was just, uh, it was awesome. And, um, you know, it's so great to have, uh, you know, such a wonderful new music musician play our works. Uh, but there are lots of people in the background. Um, you know, uh, you know, we recorded uh, all of this music at Carlton College. Um, we did a lot of the, the video excerpts and the interviews and so forth at Carlton. So thank you for them. Crackham Hall, beautiful hall where Matt is there uh, right now. And um, to the 
audio video extraordinaire at Cotton, Matthew Zimmerman. Thank you so much. And Eric Honor. And he has helped us master this over these like uh, crazy times and so forth. And thought he did a great job there too. And um, even um, we're bringing to you uh, live on uh, the web. So I, it's uh, virtual concert halls have been a great collaborator of ours. I want to thank, you know, Franny and Igor and Anna for all their help and so forth. It's it's a uh, it's a giant team that like puts everything together. So I uh, you know thank you to all. Um, so let's just wrap it up. Um, another thing, like I said, we we'll, we'll be selling this CD for um, you know uh, online and um, you know we also have a physical product. So please you know show show your love. And um, why don't we uh, play a little video of Matt kind of closing us up and we'll do an encore. I'd say the most rewarding part about uh, the contemporary music being a specialization of mine, um, I think, is that we get to sort of, as people who pursue this, sift history for everyone. Um, we've got hundreds of recordings, maybe thousands of recordings of the old masters but the music of living composers right now they don't have as many advocates just by the sheer nature of they haven't lived as long and not as many people play their repertoire and so part of what i get to do by looking and exploring is figuring out what in the small way i can contribute to this is a good piece hey everybody i've played this a lot i've took the time to record it it's worth listening to and maybe you should play it too um, that's a really kind of awesome responsibility, yes, and, but it, I think it's also quite a unique experience in the world of where the canon of classical art music is going. I get to be a part of helping to sort that, and so that's kind of thrilling for me. I guess the kind of polar opposite of that previous comment is that I don't get to turn to a hundred different recordings to figure out well, gosh, what is the right tempo? What do people do? I have to discover that all on my own, and I have to deliver and communicate that to an audience who may have never, A, heard a contemporary music piece before, or B, never heard that particular composer before, and how do I sell that? How do I make it something that's engaging and communicative of what I have to say about the piece and also what the composer has to say? It's a big obligation and I'm, I'm happy to do it.